Good morning. We're in a series, those of you that might be joining us for the first time today, called Isms and Doctrines. And today we're actually going to see what was the inspiration for that series, in part at least today. Um, We started this out a few weeks ago by saying that what you believe affects lives, yours and others. We expanded on that last week by saying what you believe about the Bible affects lives, yours and others. You know, when I uh, first started out in ministry, on the average, I spent about 30 hours a week doing counseling. And so I had these people constantly coming into my church office just throughout the day, all throughout the week. And you know, after a while, when you do something over and over again, it just becomes a part of you, and you kind of have to, I think at least, make it a little more interesting at times. And so what I would occasionally do when people would come in, you've got to recognize they're coming into a church. Very oftentimes, they're people that are a part of that church, and they're looking for counseling. And I would say, well, which book would you guys prefer that I use today? Would you prefer me to use the Bible, or would you prefer me to use the Book of Mormon? And, you know, they'd look at me like I had two heads, and... They said, well, of course, the Bible, and I'd always ask afterwards, well, why? why? Why do you want me to use the Bible instead of the Book of Mormon? Well, because we're a church, right? I mean, well, yeah, but the Mormons, they have a church too. Well, I know, I know but a, a Christian church. I mean, I'm coming for Christian counseling. Is that what you're coming for? Are you coming for Christian counseling? Or are you coming for biblical counseling? There is a difference in case you don't know. And they said, well, no, I, I mean biblical counseling. No, well, well, then why would, you, why would you trust what's in here? Well, it's the Word of God, right? The key there is they may know that intellectually. They've heard that maybe said somewhere, but do they know it and do they believe it in their heart? Because the truth is, even for some of you today, If you don't believe that in your heart, you might have it in your head, you've heard me or you've heard others say that this is the Word of God. But if you don't truly believe that in your heart, it's not going to change your behaviors because it's what you believe about this book that has tremendous power. I'm going to expand on that idea today by saying that what you believe about the gospel affects lives, yours and others. Because that's another area, sadly, that there's a lot of confusion. What is the gospel? Let me ask you a question. Do you think that an accurate understanding of God's message of salvation is important? Do you think, you think an accurate understanding is important? Really? Do you realize there's a lot of different opinions about what that message actually is? You know, back in uh, 1981... There was an Air Canada flight, Air Canada 143, that was en route, I think, from Ontario to Edmond or somewhere like that. 767, mid-flight, 41,000 feet high, ran out of fuel. Now, I don't know what you would have thought when you started to notice, hey, we seem to be dropping, right? Uh, But for me, I think I'd have been pretty frightened by that. What they found out later is that the Canada had just changed over their fueling to the metric system. And because somebody had a misunderstanding of the fuel consumption ratio and the amount of fuel that was to be unloaded at the airport, the plane ran out, this big, huge plane with hundreds of people on it mid-flight. Pretty frightening, isn't it? All because somebody on the ground didn't read and understand how important those numbers were. Those numbers affect lives. I read a cute story about a woman that uh, she had gone with some friends. They were at a convention, I think, in San Diego, 
and they decided to go across the border over to Tijuana. Well, they're shopping all the different places, and she finds this clay kitchenware that uh, she wants to take, you know, home with her. And as they're going across customs, you know, the customs agent, is there, do you have anything of value that you need to declare? And uh, she proceeded to say, well, no, not really. I just bought some pot while I was here. And, and whoa, 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 I mean, you know, certainly that word pot in her mind was a clay kitchenware pot. But in the mind of a customs agent could be something entirely different than that, could it not? So again, we need to be accurate about not only the message, but about the very words of the message, I would go so far to say. Join me if you're not already there in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul writes about this. He says, Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and which you stand, and by which you were being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Caiaphas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, and most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. In this passage, it says that Paul preached, and it says that he preached the gospel. The word there is euangelion, and it means a good news message. Literally, you could say, Paul there is saying, the good news I proclaim to you, because that's what the gospel was. It was a proclamation. In the Greco-Roman world, when there would be a military victory of some kind, there would be a proclamation that would be sent out, this good news message about a victory that had been won. When there was somebody installed into office in the government, there was this proclamation that went out. When a son was born, there was this proclamation. Now, I'm sorry, ladies, that's just the way it was back in those days, okay? But when a son was born, to a Greek or a Roman man. There was this good news message that was sent out to all he knew. Romans 10, I love this verse, verse 14. Paul writes, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So from Paul's perspective, would you say that it's important that that message was to be shared? Undoubtedly, Paul was a very firm believer that the good news message of Jesus Christ was to be shared. You might find it a little bit amazing then that in our world today, there are some who do believe that it doesn't need to be shared. In fact, in some cases, it shouldn't even be shared. It's meaningless to share it. But it says that when Paul preached, the people received. I've shared this with you before, so I won't belabor it, but I believe there's a significant difference between receiving something and accepting it. To me, the difference is whether it's in here or whether it's in here. See, if I accept something, I can accept it intellectually. I accept this argument that somebody might present to me that there was this man named Jesus who died on a cross for the sins of mankind and that he rose again from the dead three days later. Intellectually, I can accept that. But it's an entirely different thing if I receive it, where I embrace it, where I believe it. Paul says here that is a message that it's in which they stand, that they're placing trust in. Here's a great picture, I think, of something I don't think I would want to stand on. A great irony is that's actually on the side of a church. 
I'm hoping the guy who went up on it knows Jesus, okay? Maybe he knows him personally now. But when Paul's talking about standing, he's talking about that they are putting their faith and their trust in this good news message that he's preached. You know, a lot of times in the world today, we, we kind of do, right? We, we have one, one foot on the message, but we have that other foot back in the world still, don't we? We don't have both feet planted, standing. He also says it's in which you're being saved. I think that begs the question when we use that phrase, being saved. What question does it beg in your mind? The one it begs in my mind is being saved from what? Do you know there's a lot of people that would describe themselves as being saved, and if you ask them what it is they've been saved from, they would struggle to give you an answer. To me, being saved implies there's some kind of a crisis, some kind of a disaster, something that requires outside assistance or rescue. You know, when I was a small child, I was probably about three years old, my family was visiting uh, up near the Great Lakes, and somehow or the other, because, you know, I've, my memory's not that great, but I do remember this piece of the story, I ran off into the lake, three years old. Did not know how to swim. My last conscious memory was this water, this darkness enveloping me. Now, even as a three-year-old, I think I probably had some sense of crisis, okay? Right, all I remember is I blacked out, whew, but I vaguely remember a hand right as I was blacking out whew, that pulled me back out from the water. I think you could say that I was saved. I was nearly drowning in the water, but somebody, I think it was my dad, reached in and saved me. I was in crisis. Fortunately, somebody else took notice. Otherwise, we might not be having this conversation today. I also like the other thing that Paul says here. He says, if you hold fast to the word I preached. When I was a teenager you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, no, it was actually back in the 70s. But when I was a teenager, I went one summer to visit a friend of mine who lived in Houston. And this friend took me to a place called Astro World. In fact, I think they've tore it down now. The, now, some of you recognize the name of that roller coaster? Gary Linda, do you have the name of that? It's actually called the Texas Cyclone. Now, when we first started riding the Texas Cyclone, you got a picture of this, I'm probably 16, 17 years old. We thought that the real fun on the roller coaster was in the front car. And so we would always ride the front car. Now, in those days back in the 70s, it wasn't like riding a roller coaster today. You know, they had that little bar thing that went over. I mean, today you have that, poof, 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 poof. I mean, you, you can't even move, you know, you're like, oh, you're just totally, you're not going nowhere in a roller coaster today. Well, back then, you know, just this little kind of safety bar and we'd go over that thing, yeah, and we'd have so much fun. Well, finally, somebody told us that the real ride was in the back car. And so we go to the back car, and as we're getting in, we see a seatbelt there, the only one on the entire roller coaster that had a seatbelt. And we thought, well, that's for sissies, you know. We're, we're grown men already, right? And so we put it behind us. Well, the, the safety guy comes by, and he notices we're not wearing the seatbelt, so he makes us put it on. And so, okay, we'll put it on to make him happy because we can't go until he, we do. And so ch 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 we're chugging up that first hill, and we look at each other, heck with the seat belt right so we take the seat belt off we clear that first hill and I've got to tell you we were holding on fast okay I mean we were screaming like little girls looking for that seat belt as we were coming down the bottom because it served a valid purpose okay and, and I think that's the idea that Paul's trying to get here is that we can't just receive this word and store it and put it on the shelf we've got to continue to hold fast to that word. That's what I think's gone wrong in the church today. We've heard it. We've heard it preached. We maybe even accepted it or received it in our mind. 
but are we holding fast to it? One thing that I try to make a personal habit of, I try to make a personal habit that I thank God every day for my salvation. Because every day I want to remember this good news message that I heard preached. The problem in our world today is that most people don't see a crisis. And if you don't see a crisis, there's really no need for a rescuer. No need especially for a savior. And it leads us to, I think, a very important point this morning, the sin premise. Something I hope you leave here with today if you don't already have stored away. The biblical message, God's gospel message of good news, always starts with this understanding. I have a problem, and that problem's called sin. If you don't start there when you're sharing this message, you've missed the point. See, a lot of us love to talk about God's love and how God's got a better plan for us than what the world offers and all that kind of stuff. But again, honestly, until people recognize they have a problem, they're not going to look to you or anybody else for that matter for a solution. Until they re realize they've got a crisis in their life, they're not going to seek out a Savior. So that's where the message always has to start. You know, many today, I think, are in sin denial. And it leads to these bumper stickers that I see on occasion. I don't need to be born again. I was born right the first time. Or somebody will tell you, you know what? Only the weak and the feeble-minded, they need faith and religion. It's for that kind of people. But if you're strong, if you're your own person, you don't need that kind of a crutch in your life. Most of us have heard some variation, if not that very statement, have we not? Maybe even thought it ourselves at times. There are others, though, that recognize that there is a God and there is a thing called sin, but they're on what I call the self-savior plan. You know, their idea is, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and by golly, people like me, okay? You know, I do good things, is our salvation, is our fix for the sin problem, is it something we can do ourselves? Answer me. No, it is not. We cannot personally fix the sin problem. That's why we need a Savior. But what is this sin? Some would describe it as disobedience. James 4, verse 17, I think, is the best biblical answer. It's to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. That's what sin is. It's to know what you ought to do and then not do it. In almost every one of your lives right now, whether you're born again or not, you know something that you ought to be doing. And for whatever reason, you're not. Maybe in some cases it's a bigger issue than it is for others. But all of us have stuff. All of us have stuff that we continue to deal with. There are things that we know we ought to do, or let's take it the other way, things we know we ought not to do, but in fact are doing. Just a quick review of his story, if you will. Kind of got this divided up, and this part is the good, the bad, and the ugly, for those of you of that film age. The good. Genesis tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he declared what about it? That it was very good. And it says that he placed man in the garden to tend it, this paradise. And what's he tell man? Of all the trees in the garden you may eat, but not of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of that you may not eat. In fact, he goes on to give him a warning if man were to do that. In the day you eat of this, you will surely die. The bad, of course, that we learn later in Genesis is God banished them, Adam and Eve, from the garden. This perfect paradise that God had created had been corrupted by man. 
You know, it really bothers me in our world today when I hear people try to lay on God the blame for all the stuff that's wrong, wrong in our world today. That's not God's deal, okay? That's our deal, okay? It's because we've cho to, chose to turn our back on God. It's because we've chose to disobey what God has told us. All of this stems back to this place in history. But it gets uglier. Romans 5 tells us that when Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. And his sin brought death. And so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. This really speaks to a theological term, and we're going to start to move into the deep end of the pool here a little bit today. But theologically, they call this imputed sin. Because he's talking about in the moment that Adam sinned, all of us, even though we weren't even alive yet, it was credited to our account, this debt. It was imputed to us. It's kind of like right now, the national debt of our country is about $14 trillion. Do you know what your personal part of that is as one of the 300 million some odd Americans? It's about $48,000 a person. That's how much each of us individually, 311 million people, owe towards the national debt. And it's climbing, of course. That's just as of yesterday. That's been imputed. Some of the younger people in this audience might say, well, I didn't rack up any of that debt. That's not my bad. Well, the representatives of our land racked up that debt. The representative of the human race, Adam and Eve, racked up that debt to God, and it was imputed to our account. That's what Romans 5 is talking about. Now catch this. This is important for our conversation. The penalty for this imputed sin is physical death, sometimes in Scripture known as the first death. The great thing about the sin being imputed through one is later on righteousness for all is attributed because of one. There's one other kind of sin that you and I know more intimately and that's inherited sin. Psalm 51 5 says, For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. This self-centered nature that we have we were born with it. And it's passed down from generation to generation to generation. And the truth of it, many of us were born with some kind of propensity towards something. Maybe your propensity is towards sexual sin. Maybe somebody else's is towards some kind of financial sin. They're greedy or they're people that would steal. Maybe there's other people that are born with this lack of concern and care for life. And they think nothing of murder. But with inherited sin, the penalty is spiritual death. Imputed sin brings to us physical death. All human beings, ever since Adam and Eve, die physically. But all of us, because of inherited sin, we die and are cut off from God spiritually. Thus, the need we have to be born again. We enter into this life spiritually dead, uninterested in the things of God. It leads us into this deep end of the pool I've been speaking about. And I don't want you to get too caught on this, but I want you to capture at least some of what I have for you here this morning. And it's the idea in the church of what's known as total depravity. Now, here's the common ground of this idea. The common ground of total depravity is that every part of man's being has been corrupted by sin. Did you catch that? Our mind is defiled. Our understanding is darkened and confused before we become born again. In addition to that, our emotions are corrupted. And unreliable. You ever notice that? Our will is enslaved to sin. It stands in opposition to the will of God. 
And there's this battle between what I want versus what God wants, what I feel versus what God wants you to feel, what you think versus what God wants you to think. And there's this constant battle that goes on because of this total depravity. It's also believed in the common ground that it's impossible for an unregenerate man or woman to please God. There's nothing that we can do, not being born again, that can be pleasing to God. From there, there's some divergent views. One of those is oftentimes known as the softer view, which an Arminianist might hold, even some Calvinists might hold. But the idea is that relative goodness exists in even unregenerate people. In other words, let me put it this way. Even a person who does not know or believe in Christ can actually do something good, at least from the eyes of other people. At least through the eyes of other people, that person in taking care of somebody or donating money towards an organization, that could be understood as good. Doesn't necessarily fit into God's scale, but it's still the idea that they could do something good. Also within this softer view, they don't believe that total depravity thereby equals utter depravity. In other words, I'm not the worst that I could be. Can all of you think of something even worse than what you've done? See, I think that to be true, right? You know, I haven't killed my parents. If I did that, that would be worse than the other stuff that I've done, right? Are you tracking with me? So people in the softer view believe that when we're talking about total depravity, it doesn't mean absolute depravity, that I've done the very worst that I could possibly do. On the harder side, what is known as Reformed theology or pure Calvinism, that is the belief. That total depravity equals utter depravity. That you are the very absolute worst that you can be. In fact, according to the Heidelberg Catechism, it says, Are we then so corrupt that we are wholly incapable of doing any good and inclined to all wickedness? It's a redundant question because it answers itself. Indeed, we are, except as we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. They also, in the harder view, believe that total depravity means total inability. In other words, not only can you not do anything pleasing to God, but that you have an inoperable will. You can't even respond to Him. In fact, they will in this view say that the unregenerate are dead. And they quote Ephesians 2. Verse 1, it says, You were dead in the trespasses and sin. Going on to verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And they often ask the question, dead means what? Dead. What can a corpse do? I mean, if this was an actual funeral service and there was a body inside of a casket, is there anything that you would expect the body in the casket to do? No. It's dead. The Westminster Confession, which may, many of you may know as know a Calvinist document, says, Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good. Note this, because this is where our conversation is today, accompanying salvation. In other words, man is so dead, he can't even respond to salvation. In fact, David Steele and Curtis Thomas go on out of their book, The Five Points of Calvinism, and they say this, because of the fall, man is unable of himself to savingly believe the gospel. The sinner is dead, blind, and deaf to the things of God. His heart is deceitful and desperately corrupt. His will is not set free. It's in bondage to his evil nature. Therefore, he will not, indeed, he cannot, Choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. Consequently, 
It takes much more than the Spirit's assistance to bring a sinner to Christ. I'm going to come back to that phrase, but remember it for a second. It takes regeneration by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. Faith is not something man contributes to salvation, but is itself a gift of God's gift, or excuse me, is a part of God's gift of salvation. It is God's gift to the sinner, not the sinner's gift to God. Note the phrase there. It takes more than the Spirit's assistance. The idea here is aimed at discrediting what's true in most of Orthodox Christianity. And it's the idea of prevenient grace. It's the idea that God at least gives some degree of grace to a person who is lost and dead in their trespasses that allows him to respond in faith to the offer of the good news of Jesus Christ. What the Calvinist is saying is, no, that's not true. It doesn't work that way. In fact, what you need to grab about this view, and I'm going to talk about why I think this is important here in a second, so hold with me if you will. The true Calvinists believe that you, those who are regenerated, must be regenerated by God first before they can believe in Christ. In fact, R.C. Sproul, many of you know the name in his book, Chosen by God, says, in regeneration, God changes our hearts. He gives us a new disposition, a new inclination. He plants a desire for Christ in our hearts. We can never trust Christ for our salvation unless we first desire him. That is why we said earlier, regeneration precedes faith. That's a radical change to the way most of us look at salvation and the biblical gospel message. Because what they're saying is somebody has to first be born again before they'll have any ability to have faith and hear and believe in the message of salvation. That's not what I believe. That's not what a good chunk of the Orthodox Christian church believes. We believe that God, even in the dead aspect of our sin, allows us to have an ability to receive that and to respond in faith. And when I respond in faith, then God regenerates me. Faith comes first. Regeneration follows faith, not the other way around. I apologize if there's a little bit of confusion for some of you in this, but let me tell you why I bring it up. I bring it up because a lack of understanding about the gospel message, it affects lives yours and others. I've been surprised in the last few months by the resurgence in this interest in Reformed theology. In fact, this guy who most of us accredited to, John Calvin, this guy's been dead for almost 450 years. Yet today, more and more, I'm hearing people talk about Calvinism and Reformed theology. And it really made me wonder, why is that? Why is there this resurgence that's taking place there? You know why it is? It's because of easy believism. It's because so much of the church has taken the gospel message and diluted it down to nothing that people have responded and gone entirely the other way with it. We're going to get more into this view in the next few weeks and you're going to get a sense of what I'm trying to get across here. But my belief very firmly is this. You need to have a good sense of what the true biblical message is. Because if you don't, first of all, if you believe what we just talked about, there frankly is no point in preaching to somebody. There is no point in sharing the gospel with somebody because God has to cause them to be born again first. And as you'll see, he takes them the rest of the way as well. And so what do we have anything to do with it? So if you truly hold to that mindset, that view, it's unlikely that you're ever going to talk to somebody about the good news of Jesus Christ because you know that that's something that God has to do. God has to first regenerate them because anything you would say, unless he has, it falls on dead ears. And just a simple rebuttal of that Ephesians passage, I'd like to take you back 
and show you the verses in between that first one that I showed you. Remember the idea of what can a corpse do? It's dead, right? Well, according to Paul, while we were dead in the trespasses, we were following the course of this world. We were following the prince of the power of the air. And we live in the passions of our flesh. You see what I'm trying to get at? Obviously, there's something that we can do when we're dead in our trespasses, according to Paul. I showed you the good, the bad, and the ugly of history, specifically his story. But let's look at the beautiful. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. We're going to look at that verse more next week, but right now I want you to take a look at this short video. I hope you believe that today. I hope you genuinely believe what we've talked about here this morning. That you had in some cases, have in other cases, a sin problem. It's something that has separated you from your Creator. Something that He did not want, but something that your representative in Adam caused to happen. God is offering you a plan of redemption for that today. And for some of you, when we pray here in a minute, I'm going to encourage you to talk to God. And I'm going to encourage you to acknowledge to God what we've said here today, that you are a person who has a sin condition. You're totally depraved. There's really nothing you could do to earn God's favor, but that you recognize that in that crisis, there is a rescuer. And I just want you to tell God today, if this is you, that you believe Jesus is the Savior and that you're going to put your faith and your trust into him today. Now, for most of the rest of us, we've already made that choice. We've already recognized and acknowledged to God that we're a sinner. We've asked him for salvation. We've told him that we believe in Jesus Christ. But for some of us, we've turned back to that sin again, haven't we? And although we still intellectually believe this truth that Jesus Christ died on a cross, he was buried, and he rose from the grave, even though we believe that, we're not living our life with that at the center of it today. And I'm going to ask you to ask God for forgiveness, to tell God that you're sorry, to tell God that today you're going to make a choice to change that, that you're going to recommit your life to him today. For that handful of you that maybe don't, don't see that need of any kind today, I pray that you would pray for those others as we pray. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I am so thankful that years past, I heard that message for the first time and I recognized in that moment that I had a problem and my problem was sin and that sin separated me from you, that I was dead in my trespasses. And through faith, God, I chose to believe and you caused me to become born again. I thank you for that, Father. I pray that today for some in this crowd some in this crowd who haven't fully recognized where they're at with you. And I pray that today would be a day of salvation. Father, for some of the rest of us, we want to tell you that we're sorry that we've turned back to our sin. Most of us still see Jesus as our Savior, but Lord, you haven't really been master of our lives. And I pray that today that that would change for some of the rest of us that we would acknowledge the need not only to have you as our Savior, but to truly let you be the Lord of our daily lives. 
Father, as we prepare to share in communion, I pray that you would break our hearts about what it took to get us to this place, that you would help us to recognize that genuinely, truly, you loved your creation so much that you were willing to offer your life for us, to take our place, to take our punishment, the punishment that we were due for our sin. Father, speak to our hearts today, and all of God's people prayed. Amen.